for the last several days, we've been talking about the photoelectric effect. And you guys know that the photoelectric effect says when light strikes a metal, sometimes an electron was ejected. This is the photoelectric effect right here. When light, a photon of light, strikes a metal, then an electron was sometimes ejected if that photon was above the threshold frequency. What if we... What if we jack up the frequency on this photon, though? What if we supercharge this photon and make it not like, you know, violet light or even ultraviolet light, but maybe an X-ray? Like, what if we make the energy of this photon so big that the energy doesn't all go into causing the electron to be ejected? Well, sometimes what we have in a situation like that is something called the Compton effect. The Compton effect says that when a photon of sufficient frequency, like an X-ray, strikes a metal, then we get an electron ejected, just like in the photoelectric effect. But sometimes we also get a second photon ejected. So we have what amounts to the photoelectric effect and then an additional photon ejected. Now, classical theory, classical theory, Let's think back to our imaginary physics thesaurus. What's another name for classical theory? Pre-Einstein or wrong. Classical theory would predict that that second photon, that green photon that we have drawn there under the Compton effect, would be exactly the same as the original photon. So let's say an X-ray of certain frequency strikes the metal, an electron's ejected, and then, hey, the X-ray just bounces off. It's the exact same photon that we had to begin with. Classical theory would say that, but as you know, pre-Einstein, classical theory or incorrect physics um, doesn't match up with observations sometimes. The observations showed that in fact that second photon that was ejected was not the same as the first photon. That second photon was less energetic than the first photon. So let's say E2 is less than E1. The second photon was less energetic than the first. Classical theory, or pre-Einstein, or wrong, didn't predict that. Remember, we've said that classical theory sometimes is a good approximation for things that happen. Not for the photoelectric effect, and not for the Compton effect. Classical theory predicted one thing here, and um, that didn't happen at all. The second photon was less energetic than the first. The energy went down. The frequency, therefore, would have went down as well. The wavelength, by the way, would have went up because wavelength is inversely related to energy and frequency. Well, what would quantum theory predict? Quantum theory, by the way, also known as post-Einstein or correct theory. What would quantum theory predict here? Well, quantum theory would absolutely predict that that second photon is going to be less energetic than the first photon. Why? Well, now we enter, in 1908, this guy named Arthur Compton. Arthur Compton argued that this is really just a collision. It's really just a collision. Think back to the second week of Physics 30. What did we do? We looked at collisions between two cars at an intersection, between two baseballs that hit each other, between two football players, whatever the case may be, collisions where momentum was conserved. Compton argued that this is a collision where energy is conserved and momentum is conserved. Well, Compton, by arguing that energy is conserved, it wasn't really telling us anything we didn't already know. Energy is the energy of a photon was described by Einstein a few years earlier. But the momentum of a photon, this is a little bit of a this is a little bit of a tricky one. We knew the energy of a photon prior to Compton was HF or HC over lambda. So again, nothing really new there. But nobody described the momentum of a photon before. Why not? Well, think about that. Go ahead. Good. Exactly. How do you describe the momentum of a photon when the mass is zero? 
A photon doesn't have any mass. So how can it have momentum? Let's show you how we get momentum from a photon. The momentum of anything, we learned back on the very first day of physics 30, is m times z. We established already that photons don't have any momentum, though. sorry, don't have any mass, though. So how can we have a momentum when we don't have any mass? Well, if we go back a few years to 1905, Einstein in 1905, we talked about him having his miracle year. Remember where he had four big things, four big discoveries that nobody else had ever figured out before. One of them was photon theory and his explanation of the photoelectric effect for which he received a Nobel Prize a decade or so later. One of them was the special theory of relativity. You guys ever heard of that theory of relativity? He came up with two theories of relativity, actually, the special theory of relativity in 1905, and then much later on, another uh, I don't know, 12, 13 years or so later on, the general theory of relativity. The special theory of relativity, in essence, I mean, and we, we could go on for days about the special theory of relativity, but in essence, it says, when things travel faster and faster and faster, and they start approaching the speed of light, some wacky things start happening, including time slows down. Time literally slows down. It's not like we perceive time to be less, but time slows down. Some really wacky things start happening. Now, as part of that, uh, that special theory of relativity, Einstein said that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing, kind of like water and ice. Now, we have a glass of water and we say, oh, well, I want some ice. Well, we don't have any ice right now. I've got water, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? I can convert the water to ice. Or you've got this big block of ice and you want to drink a water. Well, I don't have any water right now, but I've got ice. And I can convert the ice to water because it's pretty much the same thing. Ice and water are two different forms of the same thing. Einstein said that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing. Now, this is important because photons don't have any mass, but they've got energy. So what we're going to do is not use the mass of the photon because photons don't have any mass. Rather, we're going to use the equivalent mass of the photon, which corresponds to its energy. In other words, it's like saying, I want a glass of water. I got a block of ice. I'm not going to use the water. I'm going to use the equivalent water, or I'm going to use the amount of ice that I have. Does that make sense? I'm going to use the equivalent mass here. Now, how are we going to fill in the equivalent mass of this photon? Yes, the, probably the most famous physics equation ever, maybe the one of the least understood physics equations ever, E equals mc squared. If we rearrange this, we get the equivalent mass. Look, energy and mass, two different forms of the same thing. If we take a certain amount of mass and multiply it by the speed of light squared, then it's equivalent to a certain amount of energy. If I take a certain amount of energy and divide it by the speed of light squared, then I get the equivalent mass. This is what we want to do, is sub in the equivalent mass in here. We end up getting P is equal to, not the mass, over C, not the mass times the velocity, but the equivalent mass times the velocity. This, by the way, is on your data sheet, and you do have to be able to use that equation. But the good news is it's actually pretty simple. The energy is equal to mc squared. Literally, sub in your mass in kilograms multiplied by the speed of light squared, and you get the equivalent energy. Or sub in the energy, solve for m, and get the equivalent mass. Yep. Yeah, well, it's E over C squared, right? E over C squared is the energy divided by the speed of light squared, the equivalent mass. What's the, what does C stand for? The speed of light. What does V stand for? The speed of light. So why don't we just replace V with C then? So we call it the same thing at least. Apples to apples. Yep. Yes, it's exactly what it does. It makes the equation P is equal to E over C. And in fact, if we rearrange this, this equation will appear along with this one in the top right-hand corner of your data sheet. 
Everybody open up your data sheet right now. The top right hand corner, you're going to see both of these equations. Now, there's a couple others as well, but you're certainly going to find these ones. E equals mc squared equals p times c. Einstein's energy mass equivalence, energy of a photon. Now, don't forget, this is the energy of a photon related to mass. We already know the energy of a photon related to frequency. We already know the energy of a photon related to wavelength. We just got now, we got, we got one new equation, a brand new equation that describes the energy of a photon related to its momentum as opposed to related to its frequency or wavelength. Remember what I said before we started this? What's in red is what's important, right? These two in red, you already knew. This one in red was used to derive this one in red. Now, I'm going to take this equation, P is equal to E over C, and make one more substitution there. We know that E is equal to HC over lambda. That's a little ugly. Can I simplify that a little bit? The momentum of a photon is equal to h over lambda. The momentum of a photon related to the wavelength of that photon. So we don't have any mass in these photons, but we do have energy and we do have wavelength. So we can describe the momentum either in terms of the energy or in terms of the wavelength. Now, please don't mix that up with the equation that we learned on the first day of physics 30. P is equal to M times V. It's still valid, right? This is valid for something with mass, like a proton, not a photon, a proton, or an electron, or a baseball. These ones are valid for particles without mass, i.e. a photon. Not proton, not electron, not a baseball, but rather a photon. Yeah? Here's another one. Delta lambda is equal to what? H over MC? Remember that in the Compton effect, light strikes the metal, light of big frequency like like X-ray strikes the metal, the electrons ejected, second less energetic photon is ejected, second less energetic photon is ejected, the energy goes down, the frequency therefore goes down, the wavelength goes up. The change in wavelength of the photon, the increase in wavelength of the photon is equal to H over MC, times one minus cosine theta. H is Planck's constant. And we're gonna use for that the 6.63 value. In fact, in all of this stuff, all of this stuff, you wanna use joules. Including with this newest equation. Delta lambda is equal to Planck's constant over M. That would be the mass of the electron that's ejected and C would be the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And theta would be the scattering angle of the X-ray or of the photon. And that's going to be measured in degrees. Now, don't ask me how to derive this. I tried once and I, I couldn't. I know that it comes from the law of conservation of energy and conservation of momentum somehow combined, but exactly how, I'm not sure. But as I told you before, you don't have to derive any of these equations, let alone this one. You just have to be able to use them and understand where they came from. Let's take a look at our example. The only example that we're gonna to have today, it says calculate the energy and the momentum of a photon whose wavelength is 600 nanometers. Let's get the energy first. And this is not, 
The Planck's constant value is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Remember, we're, listen, I mean, you could technically, because this is an old equation, you could technically use electron volts here, but anytime we have something specific to the Compton effect, we're going to use joules. So might as well use joules here as well. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8. And we divide that by the wavelength, which is 600 times 10 to the minus 9. This is a problem that you could have solved last week. It really is. Okay, you, you don't need anything we learned today to solve for the energy of a photon. This, by the way, works out to be 3.315 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, which if we round that to, to uh, three digits, it would be 3.32 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Again, nothing new. Nothing new there. Okay, we could have solved this last week. Now, we want to find the momentum of that photon, though. You get two options. We know that E is equal to P times C, so we could rearrange it and get P is equal to E over C. And now that we have E, we could solve for the momentum that way, or we could go back to P is equal to H over lambda, the other new equation we learned today, and say 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 over the wavelength, which is 600 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. That gives us 1.11. And the units are a little bit weird here. Kilograms, meters per second. Remember that from day one of physics 30? Why is that weird? Talking about the momentum of a photon, a photon that doesn't have any mass, but yet our units are kilograms, meters per second. Oh, well. Is what it is. The example that we just did was, was my example, but the problems that you're going to do are going to come from your textbook on page 523. You've got about nine minutes to work on those. Uh, you can finish these up within the next nine minutes. And then all you're going to have for homework tonight will be uh, the unit assignment that's due tomorrow. One, one little thing that I'm going to address before, we, before I pack it up here. Question number three um, people wonder, how do you find how much energy an electron gains? Remember that when an X-ray strikes the metal and an electron is ejected and a second less energetic photon is ejected, the energy of the photon goes down. If we find the energy that the photon is and we find the energy that the photon was, then we can find the change in energy of the photon. The photon will lose energy. Where does it go? If the photon loses energy, then the electron will gain energy by the same amount. So really what you're doing in question number three, you're looking for the energy gained by the electron, but really what you want to find is the energy that's lost by the photon. Does that make sense? Same value. 